Good evening. I'm Adrian Arsena. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, a spring melt, a surging river, and a community jolted awake by emergency sirens. Everyone's kind of frantic, trying to get photos, videos. We are in flood evacuated Hay River. Also tonight, a Calgary mother of five is dead, an innocent victim after public gunfire. I know she meant the world to her little ones. Traitor. Widespread reaction to the abuse aimed at Jagmeet Singh. That was one of the most intense, threatening, insulting. Plus, it's Thursday, and that means at issue. And astronomers reveal a spectacular new find. Where do you go? In a black hole, we don't know what happens. A black hole in the Milky Way. This is The Nation. The town of Hay River, Northwest Territories, is in a nightmare situation tonight. Floodwaters have already pushed in, and another surge could come at any time. There is a lot of damage. Water is surrounding buildings and swamping streets. It should be flowing north into Great Slave Lake, but it's getting held up, backed up by ice. Late last night, the entire population was told to head for higher ground or leave when a torrent of water rushed into the community. Juanita Taylor is there and witnessed the scramble. On the Hay River, there's a destructive cycle. The pressure of the ice builds, then suddenly lets loose. Late Wednesday night, it came as a surprise. We're just trying to get our family out of here safe so we can all safe. Are you scared? Yeah, I'm scared. <laughs> just because my mom came crying at my house, knocking the door, crying, and she said that the, my dad's house is almost underwater. Emergency crews and neighbors were going door to door, helping those who needed it most. Well, everyone's kind of frantic, trying to get uh, photos, videos, uh, gathering up around. A lot of people are panicked. Uncle Freddy's house is moving. People here say they've never seen a spring melt like this. The river so high and with so much ice. When the water surged, there was nowhere for it to go but over the banks, onto the streets and into people's homes. But look at how it's all coming right through the trees here. The entire town was put on evacuation order. Some were bused 35 kilometers to the hamlet of Enterprise. Others drove five hours in the middle of the night to Yellowknife, and some chose to stay. Uh, right now, uh, I got uh, water flooding in the basement, so it's, it's give and take. You know, you don't know when this is going to break. So. He's gone through this before, so he's already thinking about what will come next. Pretty worried, you know, insurance and everything. They're talking about 50000 or 50000 like 100000 to some people is... You know, it's not really even covering their home, right? Town officials are now assessing the damage. Really catastrophic type flooding power lines, our infrastructure, public works infrastructure, such as sewer systems, uh, have taken a big impact last night. Uh, one of our main list stations that supplies about 70% of the community is uh, halfway underwater. It's inoperable. And Juanita, we are getting a sense tonight of the scale of the damage and disruption, right? That's right, Andrew. 50% of the uh, of the sewage pipes are not functioning. Some parts of the town still are without power, including the water treatment plant. Some roads have been completely washed out. So, Andrew, this is not going to be a quick recovery, even when all the water and all this ice that you can see behind me is finally gone. So once the breakup is over, then an assessment risk will be done and then they can determine when people can finally return home. Okay. Juanita Taylor, thank you. You're welcome. Now rain is in the forecast for parts of Manitoba over the next few days, fueling fears that flooding there could be about to get worse. Overland flooding watches and warnings are out for southern and central Manitoba with another 20 to 40 millimeters of rain or more possible, parts of that area are already under watch. In northern Alberta, flood waters are starting to recede in some areas, but the crisis there is still far from over. On the Dene Ta First Nation tonight, almost all 1,100 residents remain under evacuation orders and out of their homes. 
Elsewhere, people are coming to grips with the impacts on their communities. Julia Wong has the story. Flood waters have ripped away a massive chunk of this road in Paddle Prairie, a Métis hamlet about 700 kilometers north of Edmonton. Five families who live on the other side of that gap are stuck. There's no other road access to their corner of the community. Kendra Piper is one of those trapped. We spoke to her from across the divide. It's a little bit unsettling uh, knowing that we can't, we can't just leave if there is an emergency. Community members have delivered food and other supplies by ATV. There's no timeline for when the road will be repaired. I've missed five days of work now, and yeah, that's not including the weekend. A combination of rain, recent snow, and the melting snowpack flooded parts of this remote community and other parts of northern Alberta early this week. Council Chairman Bob Ghostkeeper says flooding happens in Paddle Prairie every year, but it's never been this bad. From 1 to 10, I'd say this is about a 9. Ghostkeeper says as many as 50 homes have been flooded and will need repair. These floodwaters are the latest blow to the small community of roughly 600 people. Several homes in the settlement were destroyed in a 2019 wildfire, and now this. It's hard on the community members. I mean, we try our best to accommodate them, to, to reassure them that everything will be fine. At a community daycare center, Candy Piper picks through items to see what can be saved. Until we know what's what with what's left in there, we don't know what for sure. It just came in and it was like so high. All of us, our surroundings was underwater. The province is now promising to send financial help for flooded areas. Still, it could be weeks or even months before repairs are complete. But as the cleanup gets underway, Residents say it's a good reminder of what nature can bring. Julia Wong, CBC News, Paddle Prairie, Alberta. Well, in Calgary, an innocent mother of five is dead from a collision that happened during an unbelievable incident of street violence. Two other vehicles in a car chase involving gunfire. Carolyn Dunn explains what happened. Jeffrey Poirier is still reeling from the loss of the woman he had seen as his future. When his 40-year-old partner, Angela McKenzie, didn't answer her phone while driving home Tuesday night, he went looking for her and came upon the wreckage of her silver minivan. I hit the ground. There was... My world fell apart. You know, it's... That woman meant the world to me. I know she meant the world to her little ones. Police say the mother of five was the innocent victim of a collision caused by a car chase involving gunfire. Witnesses say an occupant of this stolen Silverado shot at this Jetta while pursuing it for blocks. The chaos came to a stop only when another vehicle collided with Angela McKenzie's. She died of crash injuries at the scene. Police are searching for this man who fled the stolen vehicle and they're promising justice. This reckless behavior has no room on our city streets. But Mackenzie's family is shattered by loss. Her ex-husband and father of her children died just a few months ago. And then to lose her after everything, it's, it's a blow. Mackenzie's children, age 8 to 17, are with their grandmother. There's a GoFundMe campaign through the Salvation Army for them. She would literally see somebody on the side of the road freezing and she would stop, take off her own jacket and give it to them. With Angela's name now tattooed on his arm, Poirier says his life is now dedicated to her children. She leaves a legacy on this earth because every one of those kids has a little bit of their mom in them. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. A 17-year-old is in hospital tonight after being shot in the parking lot of a Toronto high school. The grade 11 student has what are described as non-life-threatening injuries. At that same school, almost six months ago, a 15-year-old was fatally stabbed. A police investigation has been launched in Ontario after NDP leader Jagmeet Singh was accosted by protesters at a provincial campaign stop. Singh says it was one of the worst experiences of his career. As David Thurton reports, it has reignited concerns over growing hostility towards politicians. 
clearly the NDP leader was targeted. Now start heading towards downtown. We just got word that Jagmeet Singh is in Peterborough right now. And this is what happened when they got there. Suddenly, a provincial campaign visit by the party's federal leader turned chaotic. Sparking concern about his safety and now a police investigation. Local police had this message for those involved. Your actions and belief systems are reprehensible, unconscionable, and in some cases, criminal. Back in Ottawa, Singh says, what happened worries his staff. For me personally and for my staff, I would say that was one of the most intense, um, threatening, insulting. Across parties, condemnation. I think the, uh, the job that politicians is doing is difficult and we should be able to do it peacefully. Very concerned. Uh, look, that should, that should never happen. Uh, that's intolerable in our, in our system. There are calls for the RCMP to do more. How much longer do we have to wait before we, we actually treat this seriously and put in place the tools to, to prevent this? Because I'm really, really worried about the trajectory our country is headed in. I did find out about this. We are following up on it. I, 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 it's unacceptable. During last fall's federal election, Justin Trudeau was targeted by protesters, one of them throwing gravel at him. For some on the campaign trail now, it's an act of concern. I don't remember five years ago hearing people yell traitor at a politician. And, and that's the kind of thing that's happening now. Singh insists he's not concerned for his own safety. I've never been worried about these type of things. But as he arrived on Parliament Hill, it seemed like his entourage had grown. Appreciate it. All right, all good. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. David Thornton, CBC News, Ottawa. Thousands of anti-abortion demonstrators gathered in Ottawa today for the annual March for Life. They were met by counter-protesters. I'm here to defend life from conception to natural death. <laughs> So the issue is getting more attention this year after the leak of the U.S. Supreme Court draft decision. It suggested that court will overturn the constitutional right to abortion services in the U.S. Russian atrocities against Ukrainian civilians have been well documented, but newly emerged surveillance video from early in the war appears to show the graphic details of what could be a war crime. Now, we believe it is important to show part of it, but it's too disturbing to show all of it. This video is from a vehicle dealership along the main highway to Kiev. You can see Russian soldiers arriving at the gates. A 65-year-old security guard named Leonid and his boss come out to meet the soldiers, indicating that they are unarmed. Everything seems calm. They smoke, and then the soldiers begin to leave. But as Leonid and his boss walk away, two of the soldiers suddenly return and shoot the men multiple times in their backs. The boss dies right away, but Leonid stumbles back to the guard booth where he calls for help, but eventually dies. Just minutes after the shooting, another security camera captures the same soldiers drinking, toasting, and looting, unaware they are being recorded until one of them notices the camera. Leonid's daughter released this photo of him, saying it's how she'd like him to be remembered. Now, in the early days of the war, facing a stronger-than-expected Ukrainian resistance, many Russian soldiers lost their lives. Russia has acknowledged about 1,400 soldier deaths, but Ukrainian authorities put the toll at more than 20,000. Briar Stewart shows us the Ukrainian troops trying to identify Russia's dead. In this forest west of Kiev, in the loose dirt, a shallow grave containing the body of a single Russian soldier. The village of Zavalivka is quiet these days, but two and a half months ago, Russian troops were here as they tried to push into the capital. They were shooting, I was afraid to die, says this 75-year-old woman. Her neighbor later saw a soldier alone, limping in her yard. I looked at him and understood that he's not one of ours. He was later found dead and temporarily buried. His body is now being exhumed by a crew from the Ukrainian military, tasked with retrieving Russia's dead, left behind in a war it's waging. 
After the team arrived here to exhume this body, they received other information about another possible mass burial site, but they can't go there yet because the area hasn't been demined. Ukraine has been quick to point out how busy it's been collecting the bodies of Russian soldiers from fields and villages. Bodies found near Kiev are brought here to refrigerated rail cars. Most can't be identified. Credit cards and a wallet reveal this young man was likely from an impoverished region in Siberia. They made a decision to commit a crime. They've crossed our border of our country, and that's why I have no pity for them. On Victory Day, Russia's President Vladimir Putin proclaimed that every death of a soldier is a grief to us all. But Russia won't reveal how many of its troops are dying, instead focusing on their triumphs in combat. These are the images they don't want the public to see. Bodies sitting in storage, waiting to be claimed. If not, soldiers Russia sent to invade Ukraine could end up buried here. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Kiev. The Prime Minister has announced more support for NATO's efforts in Latvia. We will be deploying a general and six staff officers to NATO's multinational division north headquarters in Adatsi. Justin Trudeau made the announcement during a visit from Latvia's Prime Minister. That deployment will bring the total Canadian military personnel in Latvia to over 700. Finland also shares a border with Russia, and after watching the invasion of Ukraine, it isn't taking any chances. Today, its leaders said they will apply for membership in NATO. And as Chris Brown explains, Moscow has already threatened retaliation. Finland is a small country with a big army that until now has avoided formal military alliances so as not to aggravate Russia, which shares a 1,300-kilometer-long border. But Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine upended 80 years of non-alignment in just three months. Russia has betrayed us so many times, now again, and it's, it's absolutely that we should uh, change NATO. Today, little Finland is putting up such a savage defense... The, the Soviet Monster. Union's invasion of Finland in 1939 is seared into Finnish collective memory, as is the fact they lost 10% of their territory to Russia, and many Finns see parallels with Russia's attack on Ukraine now. Wednesday, as he welcomed British support, Finland's president said if Russia is unhappy, they have only themselves to blame. You caused this. Look at the mirror. Of course, with Russian state TV, nothing is ever Russia's fault. Presenters suggested this was part of another anti-Russian plot by the United States. The Kremlin vowed a response but hasn't said what. But Russia is also talking about using nukes in a way we've never heard before. And this expert course, says nuclear saber-rattling sealed the idea for Finns that it's better to live under NATO's nuclear umbrella. Why take the risk that next time, and it's literally viewed as next time Russia attacks Finland, why have to fight alone? Finnish forces have been integrated into NATO for years, including at these special ops drills our CBC crew observed this week in Lithuania, which is why acceptance into the alliance is seen as a formality. From my standpoint, they have always been a part of NATO. Sweden, which has been neutral for 200 years, is expected to follow Finland's lead and formally apply next week. And both armies could be sporting NATO's colours before the end of the year. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. CBC News has confirmed details of the Pope's planned visit to Canada to make apologies around church-run residential schools. In the last week of July, Pope Francis will stop in Quebec City, Iqaluit and Edmonton. From there, the Pope may also visit the Lac St. Anne Pilgrimage Grounds, a national historic site, and Erminskin Cree Nation, where the Catholic Church ran a residential school. The Vatican is expected to announce these details tomorrow. An aging tanker full of oil is floating off the coast of Yemen and it could break apart any day. If all the oil was spilled from the ship, it would be four times as big as the Exxon Valdez spill. Coming up, the struggle to prevent a looming environmental disaster near a country already devastated by war. Plus... The Bank of Canada governor 
has allowed himself to become the ATM machine of this government. Pierre Poliev caused a stir in last night's conservative debate. How did he and the others do? Rosie and the Adishu panel will weigh in and... One woman stumbles across offensive products for children sold on Amazon. This is literally supporting pedophilia. But can the retail giant stop it? Go back in two. This crumbling tanker off the coast of Yemen is set to trigger the world's largest oil spill. And the war-torn country is in no shape to handle that. There is a plan to stop this disaster. But Stephen D'Souza shows us it's still an open question whether the world will come to Yemen's aid. Almost eight years of civil war have left Yemen with a humanitarian crisis. But on the coast, a looming ecological disaster a problem the UN calls a ticking time bomb. It's a major disaster, just literally waiting to happen, and it will happen one day. The threat is from this, the FSO Safir, an oil tanker converted to a floating oil storage vessel in the 80s. It was abandoned when the civil war began in Yemen in 2014. Totally neglected, now it's crumbling, with more than a million barrels of crude oil inside. If, if all the oil was spilt from the ship, it would be four times as big as the Exxon Valdez spill. The Safar sits just off the coast of Yemen in the Red Sea. Environmentalists say it would devastate the coastline, covering an area larger than Prince Edward Island. It's a unique area with unique marine life, a unique marine biodiversity, including marine mammals, dugongs, mangroves, um, whales and dolphins too. Local environmentalists estimate the livelihoods of hundreds of thousands of farmers and fishermen would be affected. It would also block the key port where aid shipments arrive in Yemen. Environmentalist Mohammed al Hakami says there are two choices either global support or we wait for catastrophe. The UN has negotiated a plan to transfer the oil off the Safar, but at an international donors meeting Wednesday, they failed to raise the $80 million needed to fund it. Canada was among those that did not donate. Local activists worry what will happen next. Yemen doesn't have a plan for what happens if the oil spills, al Hakami says. That's an even bigger problem right now. The clock, meanwhile, is ticking. With its insides deteriorating, the tanker could break apart or even explode. And harsh fall weather would complicate recovery efforts. This vessel could break up tomorrow. Every day that we wait is a gamble. Uh, so that alone is a reason for urgency. The consequence, a $20 billion cleanup bill and potentially the worst ecological disaster ever seen. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Toronto. Well, Amazon is facing criticism for selling clothing for children with a sexually explicit message. The products should be banned from the company's website under its offensive products policies. But as Sophia Harris shows us, Amazon only took action after a CBC News investigation. A hoodie, a dress, a bathing suit, sized for and modeled by children. But this is not typical children's wear. These items display the sexually explicit message, I love followed by a word that's slang for penis. This is literally supporting pedophilia. Karolina Zikova was shopping on Amazon for a swimsuit for her niece when the expectant mother uncovered some of the items for sale on the website. I was shocked and I was terrified, furious, furious. Following a CBC News inquiry, Amazon removed the items and said it will take action against the third party sellers which had posted the products. It's absolutely outrageous. This child protection advocate says Amazon isn't doing enough to control what third parties sell on its site. It's clear that these things are bypassing uh, their systems and that's just not good enough when we're talking about this type of you know, sexual harm to children. Amazon said it constantly scans items posted on its site and immediately removes ones that violate its offensive products policies. Nazi flags, Hitler youth knives and... But sometimes products get overlooked. In 2015, Amazon removed Nazi paraphernalia only after CBC News investigated the matter. And sometimes problems linger. Even after Amazon pulled the sexually explicit children's wear, the Canadian Centre for Child Protection found other indecent children's items on the site. Following further CBC inquiries, those products were also removed. There's always new products coming in. 
This retail expert says with hundreds of millions of items for sale, it's virtually impossible for the retailer to vet every single one. This is an ongoing issue that um, they're going to have to uh, come to terms with and figure out a, a more durable solution. Amazon says it's now reviewing its product catalog to weed out any more sexually explicit children's items. But Zikova says it's too late for her. She has cancelled her membership. Sophia Harris, CBC News, Toronto. Scientists discover a massive black hole in Earth's galaxy. Coming up, why it proves Einstein was right. But first, Rosie's here with that issue. I can't imagine what you're talking about. <laughs> Adrian, well, you would have guessed correctly. We're going to take a closer look at some of those standout moments from the leadership debate last night, including this one. The Bank of Canada governor has allowed himself to become the ATM machine of this government. Chantal, Andrew, Althea and Elamine will join all of us after this. That's next. The Bank of Canada governor has allowed himself to become the ATM machine of this government. And so I would replace him. If you're an investor looking at coming to Canada and you hear that kind of a statement coming from a member of the House of Commons, you'd think you're in a third world country. I disagree with Mr. Polyev's approach that you can opt out of inflation with cryptocurrency. Um, magic internet money fluctuates vastly. Mr. Polyev is promoting a decentralized currency over his own government's currency. That is a problem. We should behave like conservatives again and not tell people what they should and should invest in. Just some of the heated exchanges from last night's conservative leadership debate. That part, anyway, focused on inflation, the Bank of Canada, and cryptocurrencies. So what were some of the takeaways from those moments and the debate overall? It's Thursday. I'm here with that issue. Chantelle Bear, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj, and Elamine abdul Mahmoud. Good to see everybody. Uh, I'm going to start with you, Andrew, because you had, had written, hopefully, that this debate would be different than the one <laughs> a week ago. Uh, I wonder whether uh, you, you felt... Um, that you got what you wanted out of that debate last night. <laughs> yeah, when you say hopefully, <laughs> it was said without <laughs> much hope. Uh, no, it was a depressing spectacle all around. Uh, you had the format of the debate was terrible. There were too many gimmicks like the orange paddles and the sad trombones. Uh, the rules were too prescriptive. The moderator was too intrusive. And then the whole thing gave them very little opportunity to actually talk sensibly or seriously about the issues that are actually confronted us. Instead, we got a lot of stuff about what was their favorite book, et cetera. Uh, on top of which, you've got a singularly unimpressive field that seems to grow smaller in its impressiveness as time goes on. Um, and who are, half of them at any rate, seem obsessed with fringe issues uh, like uh, vaccine mandates or... Uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin or yeah. is the World Economic Forum running all of our lives? So it, this is not a particularly uh, uh, um, energizing or impressive race so far. Chantal? Format. I mean, who knew that you could use uh, some musical instrument to stop people in a partisan setting from mentioning <laughs> their main rival, the prime minister? Uh, it has to be something new. Uh, that no one has ever thought of. As for content, I agree. We do this. You try to keep us on time. None of us can articulate a comprehensive policy in 15 or 30 seconds. So not to make a choice between any of these people, they were asked to do that for two hours. Yeah. And I'm guessing the people who are most shortchanged have to be, if they care, conservative members, because they really got shortchanged uh, last night. Althea? Yes, the format was interesting. It was more like a game show than a debate. Um, the whole idea of like uh, putting your paddle up so that you could interject when you wanted to, but then you wouldn't have any interjections left, which is what happened to Pierre Poiliev. Yeah. Uh, he was like mute for about 20 minutes uh, in the later half of that debate, um, was really unfortunate. And there wasn't yeah. a lot of time for open debate a substantial open debate and only when we did have that open exchange between um, the candidates were we able to pull out some compare and contrast between mm -hmm. the candidates and that's I think really what the membership is looking for yeah. and for many members what they're hoping Canadians are looking for too because so many 
uh, have as their path to victory, um, trying to get, you know, the non-conservative base to vote for them. Yeah. Elamine? I mean, I'm not sure that I minded, uh, you know, what's your favorite book stuff that much because, you know, for many of those candidates on stage, uh, people are not, are, not, are not familiar with them. They are unknown quantities. So it's nice to hear that some candidates prefer Amy Winehouse. Having said that, um, when you sort of get into the area of differentiation, there, you know, there were really like the three sort of big areas. Um, because like when you get to, for example, um, the, uh, there was broad agreement on oil and gas development in this country. There was broad agreement on immigration. It was nice to see that immigration is sort of agreed upon from all the candidates. Um, but then we yeah. get into issues like um, Leslie Lewis being the only candidate on stage who's explicitly saying that she's someone who's pro-life. Um, that I thought that was like a really interesting moment that I think will change the course of the debate because it will force the other candidates to come up with a sort of clearer answer. Um, and I think like we're we're basically just getting started on this. Uh, Chantal. Well, we are or we are not. This is the last English language debate until mm. uh, the recruitment of members is over, and the French language debate will feature two candidates, Pierre Poilier and Jean Charest, who can actually debate in French, and others who will struggle. So yeah. that's it. Mm. Uh, and I also believe that if you're a normal person, not someone who lives in another galaxy, and you're looking for answers uh, on the economic front, you heard more voodoo economics from the front runner than you heard solutions to your daily problems. That yeah. works well in an audience that wants to vote for you. Uh, of party members, yeah. whether that connection to the larger stage, the electorate worked, I would argue did not. Yeah, I mean, that part of that was because, as Althea said, uh, Pierre Poilievre got sort of shut out for, for portions of the debate at, at the end because he had used all of his opportunities. But, Andrew, let's go back to that a little bit more. At the, some of those suggestions by, by Poilievre, whether getting rid of the governor of the Bank of Canada or, like, a lot of conversation around cryptocurrency, I think more than most Canadians would have wanted. Well, yeah, I mean, he hitched his wagon uh, to Bitcoin early in this campaign when everybody looked like was getting rich off of it. So now the, the Bitcoin and other uh, digital currencies are plummeting. Uh, and he, naturally, he'd prefer not to be talking about that anymore. But let's be clear, he has no actual serious policy difference with the Bank of Canada. He just wants a whipping boy. He wants somebody he can mm -hmm. attack to rile up the masses. Partly it's because he wants to attack institutions in general and yes. expertise yes. in general, yes. which is a playbook we've seen from populists before. Yes. Uh, but the potential for crisis in this, if he ever got near power, because is great because financial markets, frankly, wouldn't be getting into the nuances of whatever minor differences of opinion he had with the Bank of Canada governor. All they'd be seeing was basically the bank is being politicized and its independence compromised. Yeah. Uh, and and we would all pay the price for that. And, but that is what it's about. And our, our, our colleague Aaron Wary wrote about that today, that it is uh, an anti-institution stance that Poiliev has taken here, Althea. Yes, very much so. Um, I also think... You know, it sounds crazy when you when you hear him say he would replace the governor of the Bank of Canada, but it is like the government can pick who the governor sure. of the Bank sure. of Canada is. Sure. And when their term is up, yeah. they often pick a new governor of the Bank of Canada. Um, so uh, to me, I thought what was striking was what we saw yesterday was Pierre Paul has very hot and bombastic rhetoric. But when you actually look at what he's saying, like on those yes or no questions, he was the only candidate on stage really vocalizing incrementalism. He said he was uh, opposed to uh, uh, an air cover in Ukraine. He said he was opposed to the 2% of yeah. GDP, the NATO commitment, that he would work towards it. Um, you know, he took stance as somebody who may be uh, pegged by his answers in a future election campaign. Yeah. And so he demonstrated, I think, great restraint um, interestingly enough, on, on many other questions that were posed to him. Elamine? I think it's extraordinary to call uh, Pierre Poilievre someone who was restrained um, on that stage. I mean, like, the, the, the big headlines is that everybody's talking about specifically are the Bank of Canada quote. And I think that the way that he's positioning himself, um, he's positioning that particular stance um, as a criticism of Trudeau and a criticism of the Bank of Canada's decision to allow Trudeau um, to, to run up large deficits. The idea, um, but of course, like we know well enough that the independence of Bank of Canada is really important in this country. However, it, 
it works, right? It works because this is not a, intended for a broader audience of all Canadians. It is intended for the conservative base who is frustrated by inflation. And they and so he's sort of targeting that sure. statement towards there. Sure. I wonder what consequences that will have uh, later in the future, because that is, a, I would say, quite a radical stance. Okay, we will take a quick break. We'll be back with another round of that issue. Uh, and we'll talk more, of course, about the debate. It's not enough just to unite conservatives. We need to win over swing voters. We'll talk about who the candidates were reaching with their message, whether it moved the race. That's next. Are you, yes or no, going to be a national conservative alternative and party? That's our challenge, ladies and gentlemen. When we unite the party along that consistent principle of freedom, then we bring all the various parts of our party together. It's not enough just to unite conservatives. We need to win over swing voters, people who don't, aren't part of our party. So did last night's debate help unite conservatives inside the party? And as one candidate said there, convince Canadians outside. Chantal, Andrew, Althea and Elamine back for another round. Althea, what, what do you make of that? Was there enough there that would be appealing both to the, the base, the people that care the most about the party, and to Canadians who may have been watching? Well, I would probably argue that Charest and Brown and Aitchinson would like people <laughs> who are not members of the party to be watching so they could uh, go out and buy membership cards and um, help uh, them win th this campaign. I'd say the real takeaway, like the question that kind of wraps everything up, is an interjection that Jean Charest said with regards to the Bitcoin stuff uh, against Pierre Poiliev. He, he talked about how, um, and you, you played that clip at the very beginning, about how anybody looking at an MP talking about removing the Bank of Canada governor would be seen like a third world country. And then he talked about how that was undermining institutions. And he said, conservatives don't do that. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. what's really, I think, at stake in this contest is who is this conservative? Has the party yeah. moved uh, towards a more yeah. a populist, party that Jean Charest no longer can speak to, like are, are, whose notions of what yeah, is a conservatives yeah. are really at play here? Yeah. And the other thing that he said during I think that, that was on display. Yeah. The other thing he said during the, that debate, Jean Charest, was that he was not a conservative hyphenate. And, and I talked to conservatives on this program last night who felt the same way, that hyphenating who you are as a conservative takes away from the pitch, Elamy. Uh, I think there's something really notable about the way that uh, whatever, I think if, if you are not a conservative and you were watching that debate, um, you, the, the impressionistic idea that you come away from the conservative party is quite a bit of disarray. Um, I think if, whether we're talking about the Bitcoin stuff, which I think like that kind of stuff tends to stick in the air, um, the, the Bank of Canada stuff, um, the idea that there is still a conservative um, candidate um, who wants to lead the party, who is pro-life in this country. Um, she did say that she would not sort of move um, to, 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 to change the laws in this country. But I think that's still worthwhile in terms of saying, if you are not a conservative member, then you yeah. kind of walk away from that debate with an impressionistic idea of where this party is. And I'm not sure that that is doing the party any service right now. Chantal? Um, the answer to your question is no. I don't think that people who watched uh, last night felt uh, this is a party that is speaking to me. It felt more like these are people in a parallel universe. Uh, I believe Pierre Poiliev is at this point, and this is almost the last debate, which is probably good for the party, damaging the economic and fiscal brand of the Conservative Party, which is its main card. And um, I've spoken to more conservatives who were depressed today than conservatives who were happy. That <laughs> is not a sign of an expanding camping ground with having yeah. Christmas in July. I've, had, I've spoken <laughs> to conservatives who were very meh. That's how I would describe where they were today, Andrew. <laughs> uh, there's two issues, two broad issues in any leadership campaign, certainly in a conservative leadership campaign. One is winnability, the other is identity. Uh, so Pierre Poilievre does very well at the identity side of making conservatives feel good about being conservative. He's done next to nothing to increase his saleability of the public at large and to make that winnability case. And in fact, every time he opens his mouth, he, I think, raises new questions about his judgment, about his the ex extremity, the recklessness, etc. I, I don't see anybody yet capitalizing on that. I think Jean Charest, 
I'm not sure the message of national unity is really a big winner for him. I think he has to do two things. He has to remind people of Polyarev's poor judgment, but he has to also make the case, not just that he's an unhyphenated conservative, but that he's a conservative. Okay, we're going to leave it there. Thank you. That was a great discussion. I appreciate it, everybody. And with that, I'll send things back to Adrian and Andrew in Toronto. Okay, thanks very much, Rosie. There is a treasure hunt underway in Miramichi. The loot, hundreds of dollars. The cryptic game that has thousands of people joining. Where do you go? In a black hole? We don't know what happened. There is one mystery we are closer to solving. Scientists discovered a black hole in the Milky Way. We'll tell you what it means next. Welcome back. It is gargantuan in size and ravenous, swallowing up everything that comes in its path. But don't worry, it's a long way away. We're talking about a black hole in our very own galaxy that no one had seen proof of until today. Scientists released an image of the monster 27,000 light years away from Earth, and as Rene Filipponi reports, they could barely contain their excitement. This is the first image of the supermassive black hole at the heart of our Milky Way galaxy. It looks like a fairly rudimentary picture of what's known as Sagittarius A star. But this image took an international team of scientists years to produce. The black hole resides inside the dark region at the center of this image, where its gravitational pull is so strong the light cannot escape and only darkness remains. The black hole is four million times more massive than the sun. The image was captured using eight radio telescopes positioned around the world. In 2019, the same team also produced the first ever picture of a black hole called M87. It's way bigger and 2,000 times further away than Sagittarius A star. Or we're fairly confident that there's a supermassive black hole at the heart of every massive galaxy. Canadian Daryl Haggard is one of more than 200 scientists working on the project. It's a little bit miraculous, really, that the human mind and human ingenuity and curiosity has taught us so much when we can't even leave our solar system. She says the image is confirmation that Albert Einstein got it right with the theory of general relativity more than 100 years ago, a complicated hypothesis that credited gravity with warping space and time by matter and energy and predicted black holes. It's like a verification of all of these ideas that we've had and we've been developing over many generations of scientists just really brought literally to light. Where do you go? In a black hole, we don't know what happened. Science educator Marley in. Leacock says people really are fascinated by black holes because so much is still chance. unknown. So is she believes these images will lead to answers. Away. But I really want to go more into how they change over like the time scale of a galaxy, right? Like how does a galaxy come to have a black hole in the center of the first place? A picture worth more than a thousand words, a potential key to better understanding not just black holes, but the universe. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Extraordinary. Here's an earthly mystery for you. An anonymous person is bringing thousands of Canadians together on a hunt for some cash. I have no idea who Roman Dunbervin is, but I'd like to thank him. The puzzles that have captivated Miramichi and beyond. Next. Okay, so that lucky person just found some hidden cash and did it by following a string of cryptic clues. Sound like fun? Well, you can get in on this, but you have to head over to New Brunswick. So it's all part of a game called the Mirror Machine Mystery Machine that began on May the 1st. It's still going on with thousands now getting in on it. The creator, no one knows, uses the alias Roman Dungarvan, a name pulled from a ghost story. The enchanting game our moment. Just who is Roman Dungarvan? There's just a clue usually in the form of something to do with a horror movie and that clue will lead you to a local destination here in our city. You always get to see a, a new place or a, maybe a place you didn't get to visit for the last few years. Friday the 13th there's supposed to be 13 individual prizes out there somewhere within the community. I will send you instructions on the website. I feel like in Miramichi, we're, we're a pretty quiet city. Having this huge uh, opportunity, it's real nice. Probably thousands, maybe 10,000. Like, there's a lot of people in the group. And it's all around the world. Like, 
everyone is interested. And it's really cool to see like the whole Canada like just coming into one city. And it's really awesome. I have no idea who Roman Dungarvan is, but I'd like to thank them for bringing everybody into the community and getting everybody out there and involved. It's been exciting. <laughs> so, so two things. Mm -hmm. One, why, uh, that looks really fun. But two, why doesn't something like that happen around here? Well, we could We're, go. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Yeah, I just fly Apparently over. people yeah. are being very supportive of each other while having fun. I kind of like it. Mm. That is a national for May the 12th. Good night. Good night.